Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is David Boster. I'm the chairman of Score Bucks County. We're sponsoring this event. And this is the small business uh, and the coronavirus business forum. Uh, before we get underway formally, um, I just want to give a little bit of who and what Score Bucks County is. Uh, Score Bucks County is the local chapter of a national nonprofit. Uh, we're an all volunteer organization. Our mission is simple. We foster the growth of small businesses and entrepreneurs. And we do this uh, through two main mechanisms. One is we offer seminars, hands-on workshops, and webinars like this one on all aspects of business, from starting a business to selling a business. And we provide free, confidential, face-to-face -face mentoring, one-on-one uh, -on -one with one of our experienced volunteers. And you can meet with a SCORE mentor as many times as you feel necessary. To schedule a mentor, to attend a seminar, or even to volunteer to join school. We are always looking for more volunteers. Visit our website at buckscounty.score.org. Um, one or two quick housekeeping. Please be aware that the entire session is being recorded. Once the re recording is processed, each of you, will receive a link to the video. So there's a, be a lot, hopefully a lot of information will be transmitted and communicated. If you miss anything, you can go back and watch it as many times as you need. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button. If you click that, you're welcome to submit questions as we go along. Um, there's seven, not seven, several hundred on this video. Uh, I apologize, we may not get to all the questions. I will do my best to review the questions as they come in and try to synthesize them uh, and group them. If we don't get to your question, we'll figure out a way to get you answers uh, in the short term. So with that being said, um, let me briefly introduce our panelists for today. Um, and I don't know where he is on your screen, but in the upper left on mine is James Verbeck. James, wave. Um, James is the um, Lender Relations Specialist for the Small Business Administration, the SBA. He is our district representative here in Bucks County. He has a lot of years with the SBA, a lot of years with loan uh, activities. Uh, he's, he's an expert, that's why he's here. Donna Boddy, uh, yeah, there she is. Donna owns a company called Delos. Uh, one of these days she's gonna tell me actually how she came up with that name, but until then, suffice it to say, she's been in marketing for many years too many years, more years than she'd like to admit. And she is, her company specializes in digital marketing. If it has to do with the website, the internet, Facebook, LinkedIn, blogging, she's an expert and her company will help you. Christina Rieger is uh, the attorney. Um, come on, Christina, wait, there you go. Uh, she's an employment attorney. She has 15 plus years in, in employment law. Uh, most of her clients are employers, but she's well aware of all the legal uh, ramifications of both employer and employee. She's won numerous honors and uh, awards, uh, and she's won a case be before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which is an honor into itself. Richard Kroger is uh, a SCORE volunteer, and he's uh, been in the banking industry. He's retired from banking, uh, again, for many, many years. Uh, we're very happy to have Richard with us. Nina DeRosa is an HR specialist. Uh, she admits to having over 40 years experience in HR. 
uh, which means to me, she probably started when she was like 15, but I don't know how she got 40 years in. But so when it comes to recruiting, hiring, uh, onboarding, managing, et cetera, payroll, she has experience in all those areas. So enough of me uh, talking. Um, we're here today because we're all facing some very serious challenges. Challenges that are personal level, challenges to our family. And if you own or work at a small business, you're facing some very, very serious challenges. Our goal today is to hopefully give you some resources, some tools, some advice, some help and guidance to get through this mess um, and come out on the other side with your business intact and a plan to keep moving. So having said that, we'll turn it over to Christina. And Christina, the floor is yours. Um, let me just say, I see a lot of comments coming through the box that people can't see the screens. Can you see my share screen? How are they going to answer that? They should I, see I, it. It's coming, through, it's coming through the chat. There's a ton of Q&A. Okay, the now they're saying they, they can. can't. See the screen. I'm getting okay, chat so saying they, everybody can see it. Good, good, good. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Rieger. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction. I'm an employment lawyer here in Bucks County, and I serve the Pennsylvania and New Jersey areas, and I'm licensed in both states. Uh, just a few quick disclaimers. I am providing you with informational advice, and I'm not forming an attorney-client privilege with you. Um, if you would like to be a client of mine, I'll give you information uh, at the end of this session. Um, but I need to provide you with those disclaimers that this is for informational purposes only and I'm not providing legal advice. So with that, let me go forward. I'm going to speak a little bit like a car salesman because I have a lot of information to convey to all of you, but I do provide my contact information if you have questions. First, if you're handling COVID in the workplace, you need to be enforcing the social distancing if your businesses are open. You need to post signs including the new Department of Labor signs regarding COVID, which are on the Department of Labor website. According to the EEOC, there was new guidance provided that you can take the temperature of employees as they enter your facility or building, and you can send them home if you suspect or feel that they um, have a high temperature or um, are showing symptoms of COVID. Um, you can send them home with or without pay, that depends. It depends on their ability to telework and whether or not they qualify for the new Family First Coronavirus Act, uh, which we will be going over today. They can use their personal time if they don't qualify. Um, and be careful about the disclosures uh, regarding if you have somebody that has tested positive for COVID, um, although you might not have to comply with HIPAA if you don't fall into the classifications of who is a HIPAA provider, you still have to require and, and comply with all of the privacy regulations, which means you cannot disclose the individual that has COVID. However, you have to take precautions of your workforce and find out uh, who that person has been in contact with, as well as um, what um, self-quarantining those people that have had direct contact with the person that tests positive. And the last numbers I heard were that test results for people that are being tested are running five to seven days to get those results. Okay, so I want to go over the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, also known as the FFCRA. It was enacted on March 18th, and it is effective tomorrow, April 1st, and it expires on December 31st. We know a lot, but we still don't know a lot. Um, and new guidance from the Department of Labor is coming out every single day. Um, if you'd like to get more information about that, I'm posting blog posts as well as articles on LinkedIn every single day. Find me on LinkedIn, link in with me. Um, I summarize the guidance that comes out on a daily basis um, as it applies to small businesses, which are my clients, um, and let you know how the laws impact you and which ones are most significant for your business. Okay. The FFCRA has two parts. The first part is the paid sick leave. Um, the paid sick leave, you qualify as an employee 
for paid sick leave for six conditions. Uh, those conditions are, I'm going to go through them briefly. First of all, it applies to all employees without limitation. If they started with you today, this applies to them tomorrow. There's no waiting period. They get two weeks paid. Um, it's effective immediately, and there's no carryover or payout of this time. So if you have employees that don't use this at the expiration on December 31st, they don't get it paid out, and it doesn't carry over into their sick leave bank. <clears throat> it's a use it or lose it. Um, and it comes with tax credits. Uh, we'll go over the small business exemption in a later slide. Um, and there are two components that are being excluded right now for both the paid sick leave and what's called the extended FMLA. And those are healthcare providers and emergency responders. Uh, there are still definitions that we're waiting for on what classifies somebody as a healthcare provider or an emergency responder. At this point, the guidance that I'm giving my clients in the home care field, if you're a home care provider, this, exam this exclusion does not apply to you as the regulations stand right now. You're not providing healthcare services, so those exclusions do not apply to you. This applies to full-time and part-time employees, and I'll go over the rates of pay depending on which qualified sick leave uh, applies to your employees. So with that, there are six conditions on which an employee can get paid sick leave. The first three provide for a full-time employee to get 80 hours of paid sick leave at the rate of $511, a maximum rate of $511 per day or their salary, whichever is less. Uh, the three conditions are to comply with a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order relating to COVID, the employees having been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to, due to concerns of COVID, or the employee experiencing symptoms of COVID related to a medical diagnosis. For those three, they get the $511 or their salary, whichever, or their pay, whichever is... Um, whichever is, is less. The, the self-quarantine or isolation order, the first requirement, a stay-at-home order is not an isolation order. So these people that are staying home, that's not an isolation order. Also, they, they only qualify for these the first three, for any of these six, if they cannot work or telework. So, they, so that's a big condition. They can't work or telework. For any of these conditions. The second three conditions, um, they get two-thirds of their pay, um, and for part-time employees, they get, uh, they get their prorated part-time uh, amounts, and those guidelines are still coming out. And if you look to the Department of Labor website or any of my blogs, I link to all of their frequently asked questions, and there's questions on there regarding part-time, but those are still being developed. So the other three reasons are to care for an individual who is subject to either an isolation order or a self-quarantine type of situation, to care for an employee's son or daughter if the school or place of care is closed or the caregiver is unavailable, and the, it, the sixth reason is the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar condition as specified in by designated federal agencies. Kind of leaving that one alone. It hasn't been really explained at all. So those are the six reasons. And the assumption is that they cannot work or telework. So the rates of pay are determined by whether you're caring for yourself, in which case you'll get the higher rate of pay, or you're caring for somebody else. So let me move on. The expanded FMLA, you'll see the picture in the slide is a picture of child care. It's essentially a child care bill. Uh, for businesses under 50 um, who don't already have to comply with FMLA, the only condition upon which an employee can get extended FMLA is to care for a son or daughter under the age of 18 if the school or place of child care is closed or the child care provider is unavailable. That is the only condition upon which the extended FMLA applies to businesses under 50. Businesses over 50 obviously still have to comply with the regular FMLA requirements 
and this is not an additional 12 weeks of care. It's in a, it's, it, it runs concurrently with any FMLA they ha already have or already have used. The expanded FMLA provisions apply to existing employees only who have worked at the company for at least 30 days. So from March 2nd and before, um, it's 12 weeks of care, but the first two weeks are unpaid because they, they should fall within the paid sick leave. Um, it's a qualified absence in that um, you have to meet the, the eligibility requirements. And there's provisions just like in the FMLA that for businesses under, under 50, they may not have to restore the position if the business doesn't survive or you know, has laid off that position or, or eliminated that position. So there's requirements in the re regulations regarding that. Um, the rates of pay are, are similar. It's two thirds of the person's pay. Um, it applies to full-time, part-time, and temps. But now I wanna go through quickly the small business exception. There's a lot on this screen. Um, but I'm gonna go through this quickly because this probably applies to most of you. This regulation came, this guidance came out Sunday but on, from the Department of Labor, it's on their website. The exemption exception applies to any employer, including religious and nonprofit with fewer than 50 employees. Um, that Those businesses are exempt from this regulation uh, for providing paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave when doing so would jeopardize the viability of the small business as a going concern. That's what the law said when it was enacted, signed into law on March 18th. What that means is it can mean any of these three things. The provision of paid sick leave or expanded family medical leave would result in a small business's expenses and financial obligations exceeding available business revenues and cause the small business to cease operating at a minimal capacity or the absence of the employee or employees requesting paid sick leave or extended, extended family medical leave would entail a substantial risk to the financial health or operational capacities of the small business because of their specialized skill, knowledge of business or responsibilities, or there are not sufficient workers who are able, willing, and qualified and who will be able at the time and place needed to perform the labor or services provided by the employee or employees requesting paid sick leave, requesting the leave, and these labor services are needed for the small business to operate at a minimal capacity. So what that means is if your business qualifies for any of these three conditions, you may be able to get an exclusion um, exemption from providing that, that the leave under the, <coughs> under the FSCRA. Um, to do so, you should be documenting, you should have a policy for this new law, and you should have forms that the employees fill out and you should be collecting supporting documentation, like if the school is closed, you should have that email or the, the state order or a doctor's order or your test results, depending on which condition you, you fall into. And you should be maintaining those records. I've put together a packet that I'm offering of, of those four documents for, for a minimal cost that employers have them so that they're keeping records of this information so that they can support this exemption when they need to. So lastly, before I get the yang from Dave, um, the posters are available. The posters that need to be posted at the website are available. The notices are the ones I just talked about. You should be providing them to your employees. Um, you should have a policy. You should have, just like you have, if, if you're a bigger business, you have FMLA request forms. You should have paid sick leave request forms and extended family leave request forms. And I also have an employer checklist of all the things that you need to make sure that you have so that you qualify for this exemption. And most importantly, most importantly, do not discriminate. Uh, be careful how you're applying these policies, how you're allowing the sick leave to occur, how you're um, implementing and complying with all the regulations that are coming out so you don't discriminate or retaliate against people that are trying to get the leave um, and get the requested assistance that they need. So that's it for me. Link in with me. Uh, my name is Christina Rieger. I'm on LinkedIn. I do blogs almost every day and articles summarizing all of these regulations. Email me if you want to get on my blog post. My email is listed there. 
send me questions if you're interested in getting the policy packet or setting up a minimal time to meet with me consultations. I'm doing them for small businesses at discounted rates to help these small businesses go through all of these policies and see how to implement them in a way that helps them survive these issues. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. Very nice. I have one, there's one quick question I think you can address right now. And this was asked by someone named Cheryl. If our employees are on, are on unemployment, what does that mean rego regarding paid sick leave? Also, our employees are on commission. Do I pay based on an average? So they're on okay. unemployment, do they get sick leave? Okay, so if they're on unemployment, that means you furloughed them or laid them off. They do not qualify. They are not considered employees and qualify for the, for the paid sick leave. It's very important that employers understand that the paid sick leave and the extended family medical leave only apply to existing employees that, that are currently on the roles and that you are an existing business and not shut down at this point. If you are shut down and not able to provide any services at all, these regulations don't apply until you're able to be up and running. Um, but importantly, importantly, importantly for businesses, if they are collecting unemployment, if they're collecting workers' comp, if they're, um, if they're collecting a salary, they cannot get these leaves. They can't double dip. If they double dip, you may jeopardize the tax credit that's available to you. It's a 100% tax credit available to you that can be paid on your, that you can, you can apply for on your quarterly taxes. Talk to your accountant. You can even deduct the taxes that you're paying and offset them to get these credits immediately, but they cannot get both. So if they're on unemployment, they don't qualify. The second question okay. I haven't seen if you shoot me an email, I will, I will look into that one because I haven't seen any regulations come out about commissioned employees yet. Thank you. Uh, unshare your screen, please. So we turn now to Nina DeRosa, who can give us some HR advice in these troubling times. Nina. Good morning, everyone. Um, as, as Dave said, these are very challenging times for everyone. And I can imagine that none of us ever thought we would see something like this in our lifetime. Uh, being in a small business certainly has its challenges to begin with. So to add this on top of everything really, uh, you know, is not something that everyone needed. So having said that, you know, I'd like to try and look at some of the things that we can do to stay positive during this time. And, and by now, many of you may have stopped business operations and let some of employees go, but if not all of your employees. If you have not done that, I'd like to make the following suggestions to help you through this difficult time. First and foremost, follow all the government official regulations, communications, restrictions. The health restrictions and policies are in place to help us weather this storm. So it's very important that we pay close attention to them. Also, those things change daily. So please make sure that you stay on top of those things, whether it's through the news media or reading anything, whatever you need to do, please make sure that you do stay on top of that. Um, stay informed and keep your employees informed. Um, I know that Jim Verbeck will probably touch on some of these, but these are two things that I think will help employers right now, as well as help employees. Um, there are a number of loans available through the Small Business Association. One of them is the payroll protection loan. Um, this is a low interest loan that you can apply for, and it's for up to 10 years. You can defer the payments anywhere from six months to one year, and some loans may even be forgiven depending on the situation. If you maintain your payroll for eight weeks for all employees at a normal pay, you could be eligible for this loan. Uh, to apply for this loan, you need to go to the Small Business Association website and upload Small Business Association or SBA Form 413 to apply. Another loan that's out there for individuals, and this will help employees as well, is that there's the economic, in, excuse me, economic injury disaster loan, 
which is an emergency grant for up to $10,000. Even if you've been denied a loan, you can apply for this grant, which can be utilized to pay for sick leave, maintain payroll, or meeting other business expenses such as rent or utilities or things like that. And these grants are available to make sure that you keep your business floating and employees you know, engaged in work. Once again, I have to reiterate that you must make sure that you check all local, state, and federal websites, as well as the Small Business Association site, as these benefits can change daily. For the employee, communication is very, very important, and it is the most important thing you can do for your employees. Be clear, be concise, and be thoughtful. Um, think before you speak. I know a lot of people uh, have been you know, sharing information with their employees, and the next day they change their mind and do something else, and then the next day they change their mind again and do something else. Please think out what you want to do. Plan it out and then communicate it to your employees. It's very important. Nothing is more confusing to an employee than when management sends out confusing messages. If an employee is on furlough, make sure that you communicate with them as well. Keep them updated as well. It's important that you let them know that you're doing everything you can to keep them informed and to keep the business going. If you are operational, be sure to communicate with employees daily. Reassure them that you're doing everything you can to keep them employed and keep things going, but you also have to keep them safe. There are laws that protect employees in the workplace, such as OSHA Act 1970, which states that employers will furnish his or her employees with a place of employment that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death, serious illness, or physical harm to their employees. There are no laws actually in place right now for COVID-19, but OSHA does recommend that the following controls be in place if you are still uh, engaged in employment. Engineering controls. Be sure to put physical barriers or sneeze guards in place for employees, especially those that are working on mechanical devices. This not only present, prevents them from sharing anything with employees, but it also prevents employees from sharing anything with them. Administrative controls. Be sure to place employees at at least six feet apart. I know in some businesses that can be difficult, but we have to be creative in today's society, so I'm sure we can do our best in following that social distancing guideline. It's hard to change human behavior, but this, you know, with a little practice, we can get that into place as well. If your employees are sick, tell them to stay home. You don't need to have them bring in any illnesses or any exposure to uh, other employees and that they should stay home for their health as well as the health of other people in their office. Safe workplace controls. Have disinfecting wipes and hand sanitizers available for your employees at their workstations. If those items are not available, there are a number of different things that can be used in their place, such as alcohol, bleach, etc. You can also check the internet, excuse me, to see what types of homegrown remedies you can uh, put out there. Um, but it's important that you do keep these disinfecting products close to your employees and encourage them to use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Personal protective equipment. Um, this is an additional level of protection for your employees. It could be masks, gloves, eye protection, respirators. Those are the types of things that we see healthcare workers using at this time. But there are other circumstances which, you know, employees may need to use these PPE uh, items as well. Make sure that you have these types of things on hand for your employees' safety and for your safety as well. Under the current regulatory uh, framework, many employers are not legally required to keep their employees safe from this virus, but we hope that morally they understand that that, that is an obligation that they should meet, and hopefully they will. If an employee is able to work from home and it will not cause an undue hardship for the employer, allow them. I know some people don't trust people working from home, but if you don't trust them to do that, you shouldn't have hired them in the first place. 
If an employee cannot work from home, offer some sort of financial support, uh, whether it's in a short term, such as uh, possibly allowing them to take time off, uh, let them work with another employee. Instead of working 40 hours a week, let them work 20 hours a week and do a job share with an employee. And even if it's, if it's just for a week or two, it's certainly helping them uh, getting on their feet and keeping financially solvent. Um, also, be compassionate and considerate of your employees' fears and concerns. Reassure them that you're in this together and that with their help, the business will survive and you'll all be healthy in the future. Remember, those employees helped you get your business started, so don't forget them. And when all this settles, be a little empathetic. When they return to work, even if they've used all their vacation time or sick leave or a PP, uh, uh, personal time off, allow them to take a, a, a week or two off when, and hopefully when all of this comes to an end. Um, if you can't afford that, a small bonus can be uh, certainly appreciated, and even a gift card to a restaurant so that the employee can enjoy some family time. These are small things that can actually go a very long way with employees. And as I said, there are a number of things that you can do to show your appreciation to the employees. Just remember to treat them as you would like to be treated during this crisis. And at the end of the day, we must all work together and meet this challenge. So I hope that I've been able to share some information with you. And uh, Dave, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. You're welcome. Uh, very nice. Good advice. Of course, those gift cards to the restaurants will be appreciated. We might have to wait a little bit to fulfill those. Um, Donna Boddy uh, is our marketing expert. So Donna, um, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you, Dave. I just want to say that um, this is a great thing that SCORE is putting together to help everyone do things. And really what I want to talk to you about today is that the future is banging down our door. It's a really uncertain time that we're going through right now. And I'll explain what I mean about that in a minute. But I first just want to acknowledge that this is really hard for business owners. It's hard for our employees. It's hard for our contractors, our customers, our families, our kids, our aging parents. There's so much anxiety and uncertainty happening right now. And we can't really change the circumstances that we find ourselves in, but we can choose what we're going to do about it. So let's talk about that. Think about all those things that you said that you are going to do in your business at some point in the future. Like, are we going to get around to updating the website? We're going to let customers book an appointment online. We're going to take payments online or sell our products there. We're going to be able to work remotely efficiently, not tied to a computer in the office, or we're going to get around to creating more case studies or portfolio examples or helpful blogs or reach out to people on LinkedIn or grow our email list or start doing videos. We hear this all the time from our customers. Here is where we want to be in the future, but right now we can't get to that. Well, guess what? The future is here right now and it's banging down your door. Social distancing means physical distance. All those things we're used to doing in person, but it doesn't mean that we have to be socially distant. It doesn't mean that we can't continue to build relationships with our customers and our prospects. So as difficult as it might be, I think now is the time to try and find opportunities are there, not just rush through in panic mode or shrink away and hibernate, but to take actions now that will position you better once things do get back to normal. Whatever the new normal is going to look like, there's so much uncertainty now, and this kind of seems like one of those defining changes we are experiencing, and I think the uncertainty is going to be with us for a while. So what can you do? I'd like to give you five actionable tips that can really help you right now. And the first one is to communicate regularly and transparently. 
you know, acknowledge what's going on and how it may impact your customers and your audience and don't hesitate to ask for their support. A lot of people are sitting home and they don't really know what to do and they don't maybe know how to help you. Um, you know, would gift cards help you out? Would you, you know, what, what, what is it that you need? Um, be transparent about it and be transparent about how you are still working for your customers. And then you want to figure out how you can add value. Education is one of the easiest ways to add value right now. So what knowledge do you have that would be helpful to your client? I saw a meme the other day that sums up another approach. The only thing you should be spreading right now is kindness, compassion, and humor. People need that too. So as people are staying home, the amount of time that they're spending online has increased tremendously. So start some conversations there and think of your communications as a conversation that you are having with your clients and prospects and the people who follow you. Especially for local businesses, people want to do business with people, so it's okay to show that you are human. So writing or speaking in a more conversational tone is good practice for digital communications in general, whether that's your website or your emails or your social media. And one important thing to remember is that consistency gets tractions. Once and done or sporadic communication really doesn't cut it. Uh, if you haven't been consistent in your communications, especially email marketing and social media, now is really the time to start. You need to remind people that you are still around. We see better results all the time when our clients are consistent in communicating. I have a short uh, weekly newsletter called Tech News Tuesday, and I've been doing that each week for several years now. It's a real quick, actionable tip or news item about digital marketing that I think uh, would be helpful or interesting to business owners. Well, after a while, I now get emails all the time from people who are ready to engage with our services because we've been helpful and top of mind, even though we might not have had in-person contact for several years. So the second thing that I want to tell you to do is to take some time to plan. If you have downtime right now, use this opportunity to do some strategic thinking about who your ideal audience is. What problems do they have? How does my company solve these problems? What should my product and service offerings look like? And what's working and what needs improved? A lot of times as small business owners, we get so wrapped up in the day to day that we don't really have time to work on our business. So think of it as a, CEO retreat. I have a few customers that periodically take some time away from the day-to-day -day of their businesses to plan and I see how much further along their business gets and the results that they get. I actually had some time booked on my calendar this year to do the same but if we're still staying home it might have to be going all the way to the guest bedroom with some headphones on instead of a few days in that hotel with the spa that I was hoping for. So put the Netflix binge on hold for a little while and spend some time evaluating your marketing and business goals. The third thing is to position yourself for now and the future. So use this time to really up your customer experience and also streamline your operations. So have you been meaning to get all those contacts into your email system or a CRM? Um, you know, you wanted to take payments on the website. Maybe you need a better project management process and tool. What is it like to do business with you on a mobile phone? Can you improve that? What can make remote working a better experience? We have a customer and I'm going to mention them because they have been doing an awesome job at this. It's Sweet Ashley's Chocolate. They make the best handmade chocolate and the Easter Bunny is definitely still coming, but they didn't have all their products on their website because many things don't ship well. Store traffic was more of a priority and then the holidays, Valentine's and now Easter are busy times for making chocolate. But stay home happened and lots of people in your store isn't such a great idea right now. So we work with them 
over the past few weeks to get more products on the website, a no contact pickup option, as well as shipping, to get products tagged so that you can shop right from Facebook and Instagram. And they're also doing video product descriptions. Well, guess what? These are things that are going to save them time and get them more business after everything opens up again too. People previously called in or emailed orders to be picked up at a store all the time. So that meant multiple places on tracking inventory, orders, payments, and that takes time uh, that you could be doing something else. And it also isn't as always as easy for the customer. So do what you need to do now to get by, but try to do things that were also going to position you for the future as well. The fourth thing that I want you to do is to create content. If you have an editorial calendar, start batching and planning ahead for later in the year so that when you're busier, you have content ready to go. Many of our customers have said, okay, well, we have more time now. We can write about those projects or those articles that we were saying. Get them all ready to go in the queue. It's a great time to update your portfolio or get your website stuff done, plan campaigns for later in the year, take pictures and videos of your products, create social media posts and email, and these can all be scheduled out over time so that they're all ready to go. If you don't have an editorial calendar, start making one. Figure out what platforms you're going to use. Are you gonna blog? Are you gonna podcast? email marketing? What social media channels should you be working on? What types of content do you have? Featured products or services, tips, education, and then align all this with the calendar. So many businesses are seasonal. A landscape may do different things of lawn care in spring, summer, fall, and maybe snow removal in winter. There's also back to school, Halloween, tax season, your business probably has a rhythm, so plan your content around that. And then the last thing I wanna tell you to do is to experiment. There's never been a better time to try new things. We are all learning new ways of doing things right now. So get out there and start doing video, for example. Video is so important in marketing right now. A lot of people are scared to get on the camera. They're not quite sure they're gonna do it right. Well, national organizations have their talent working in makeshift home studios right now. You have a pass right now to experiment because everyone is doing different things. Use it, try new things. It might work, it might not, but if you don't try, it's not going to, to get you where you need to go. So to sum up, I wanna say, try to see the opportunities and take advantage of them communicate consistently with your audience, and also plan to take some time to plan and to take care of yourself. Now, I'm gonna put this information, I do have a blog up on our website right now, it's uh, delosinc.com. I don't know if you can see my email address with my uh, name there, um, which has this information. But, um, you know, just keep on keeping positive and try and see the opportunities there. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Very good advice. Richard Kroger is uh, experienced in the banking industry. Uh, Richard, the floor is yours. Unmute yourself. coming in and being part of this. Dave, we okay, do you think? I don't see you. Did, is your video on? It was, wait a minute. There you go. Okay, all right. All right, let me do something on the screen, cancel that, okay. All right, I think I'm back. Anyway, as I was saying, first of all, I wanna thank everyone for um, coming in this morning and being part of this webinar. And <clears throat> excuse me, as Dave said in the intro, um, my background is primarily in banking. Uh, I spent kind of longer maybe than I want to think about doing that. Um, commercial banking, business banking, and also I sold SBA loans for over 10 years. Now, 
I have to qualify what I just said by saying that what I, the loans that I sold are dramatically different from the things that, James, that Jim Verbeck is going to talk about. But, but I do have um, some general points that I wanted to mention, just bullet points uh, for people um, to be aware of and to think about going forward while you're thinking about applying for a loan or uh, just in general terms as far as banking is concerned. Um, most of you probably have gotten emails or uh, text messages that banks and credit unions in the area have uh, reduced their hours uh, and, and they're now encouraging you to use the drive ups more and more instead of coming into the branches. I would just say, um, you know, when you're thinking about going to a bank, check, double check and make sure what, that you know what the bank or the credit union's hours are. And in some cases, you might need to call ahead of time and make a particular appointment because what they're trying to do is limit the number of people that come into the branches, just as another method of trying to reduce uh, the overall exposure that people might have. Uh, along, those, along those same lines, be patient with the people in banking and the credit unions because um, in addition to their hours maybe being reduced, in some cases you might have situations where people in the banking industry are now going to be doing jobs that they either weren't prepared to do, haven't been trained to do, whatever the case might be. And the reason that I'm mentioning that is the concern that I have toward the end of this week and into the first part of next week, when people start to apply for all of these different SBA loan programs, the concern that I have is that the people in banks are going to be swamped with their normal work and with the additional work that they have coming in. So, you know, I would kind of piggyback on some comments that you've heard already about just trying to be patient with the people that you're working with at the different banks and credit unions while they're trying to do their normal work in addition to whatever their increased workload might be. Um, along those same lines, I would, for those of you who have existing credit facilities with the banks or the credit unions, and you're experiencing difficulties because of the challenges that we have right now as far as keeping current with your debts, contact either your particular loan officer or contact the bank or the un credit union and ask them for some type of extended terms, maybe some kind of debt relief, maybe instead of making interest payments, I'm sorry, instead of making your re regular principal and interest payments, uh, maybe you could only make interest only payments for a period of time. A lot of times uh, when I was doing SBA loans before and I was talking to someone who wanted to start a business, my credit people would approve an interest only period for the first maybe three to four months to help get the business up and uh, to improve the uh, startup cash flow requirements that the business might have. Um, Along those same lines, uh, for people who have a business and you're renting space, reach out to your landlord. Um, ask if there's some kind of relief that he or she could give to you, once again, along those same lines of maybe reducing the rent uh, for a period of time or some type of um, rental um, grace period, if you would. Um, just as a way of trying to help you keep the business operating and also not have a negative impact on the business cash flow. And um, last point that I want to mention, and, and I say this to all of the clients that I'm working with, especially the clients that are in a startup and an early stage situation, and they're thinking about applying for financing from either a bank or a credit union, please check your credit reports. Please make sure that the information on the credit report is yours and that the information is accurate because that's the first kind of hurdle that you have to get past when you apply for financing. 
Um, poor credit, poor personal credit can be a deal killer. And I've seen it, unfortunately, I've seen it um, more often than I want to think about. And I know um, that with the loan programs that Jim Verbeck is going to touch on, some of the normal requirements banks have for lending money to businesses have been relaxed. I mean, for example, um, there are no personal guarantees are going to be required. Um, as far as I know, good personal credit is still going to be a requirement. And once again, it depends on the uh, particular uh, credit people at the bank or the credit union of uh, what their requirements are as far as their credit score is concerned. But um, it's really something that you need to stay on top of, as I said, uh, to make sure that the information is yours and that the information is accurate. Um, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to shut up. I've covered kind of what I wanted to, the points that I wanted to mention. Um, please feel free if there are questions or comments that you have for me, I'll be happy to speak with you offline. Uh, you can reach me either by phone, email, or text. Um, the email is richard.kroger, K-R-O-G-E-R, -E at scorevolunteer.org. Uh, my phone number is 215-776-2156, and uh, I'm available also on LinkedIn. So um, thank you all once again for participating. Um, Dave, that's, those are the points that I wanted to cover. Thank you. Thank you very much. We turn now to James Verbeck of the SBA. Um, James, um, I know for a fact, has been inundated. Uh, I really appreciate him, him taking the time to speak with us today. Um, he's barraged with emails and phone calls. And as you can expect, uh, he's been working very late every night. Um, James, you're on. All right. Good morning. You need, yeah, you need you good. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, kind of pick up where um, uh, Dick left off a little bit uh, and share some uh, personal advice before I get to my more formal uh, SBA messaging that I, which is kind of exciting that I want to share this morning with everyone. Um, I uh, I too come from a background in the commercial banking area. I've got I spent over 20 years in industry, and um, I I want to share some thoughts that I've shared with a number of people that I've talked with over the last nearly three weeks now in helping them prepare and get through this event, none of which, none of us know how long this may take. Um, and the primary message um, I've provided everyone is, you know, you're going to have to look for solutions from a, def uh, a number of different areas. As Dick mentioned uh, already, if you've got a landlord, you need to be talking with your landlord. Um, uh, no one, no retailer out there who's had to shut his doors and whose revenue has been cut to zero is going to be able to afford their rent payment. Likewise, the insurance companies, um, everyone's faced with monthly insurance bills. Um, there is going to be deferments offered by all of these um, companies. There's already national ads by the major national banks offering deferments on mortgages and auto loans. And, and just, I, I haven't talked to a banker yet, and I know quite a few of them, and I know quite a few uh, chief lending officers that aren't daily now um, signing over deferments uh, for conventional loans, for mortgages. They're, they're working out uh, plans for deferrals of car payments. Um, all of these avenues need to be pursued uh, because the, you know, the SBA is not an, an all-encompassing solution for everyone. We, we are, we do have exciting, th I do have some ex exciting things to tell you this morning, but uh, there isn't going to be uh, one source for anyone's, um, uh, you know, anyone's plan to get through all of this. Uh, so please, 
uh, please be please start the conversation through emails and uh, phone calls to everyone that you need to in order to uh, sketch together uh, a workable plan for your for your business, whether it be you know a barber shop or a or a restaurant or whatever out there. Um, there was some exciting news. There's we've been taking applications for the uh, economic income disaster loans for some time now. That follows the traditional disaster loan template uh, that's been in place for a while. And let me just back up here for a second and remind you, um, the agency, you know, under normal circumstances, when there's a national disaster, be it flood, hurricane, tornado, most recently, uh, you know, like a tornado in Nashville, the agency has always prided itself in uh, responding to those disasters. And it does a really good job of assessing and identifying those communities and those individuals that need to be stood up after that event. Usually those events are o over after a day or in the case of a flood, maybe a week to 10 days. And then everyone's immediately cleaning up and and getting their lives and businesses back to normal. Um, this is a unique event. So we've been taking applications for a number of weeks. Um, uh, for everyone that went to the website and um, uh, put in an application for an, uh, and we're, we're referring it to it as an idle loan. It's the, um, uh, the economic, injury, disaster loan, um, all those applications as of this past Friday got funded with the CARES Act. Um, and one of the exciting pieces of information that I had to share this morning is a piece that should have gone, that was supposed to go out to everyone that had already submitted an application as of last night. I have verified that a number of people that I've worked with over the last couple of weeks have received this message. If you're seeing it for the first time and you have a like, you have an um, uh, an application in yourself, um, uh, and haven't received this, then please take please take careful note. What it says essentially is, if you've applied and you wish to apply for an advance, there's $10,000, there's a $10,000 advance on your economic injury disaster loan available. This advance may be available even if your idle loan was declined or is still pending and will be forgiven. If you wish to apply for this advance on your idle loan, please visit sba.gov forward slash disaster as soon as possible and fill out a new streamline application. And I'll say off to the side, this is a very streamlined application. It won't take you more than 15 minutes to fill this out. In order to qualify for the advance, you need to submit this new application. Even if you previously submitted an idle application, applying for the advance will not impact the status or slow your existing application. And then, some of the other best advice I have to give you this morning is please sign up for updates. And all you have to do is go to sba.gov forward slash updates. You can follow uh, the SBA on Twitter. Twitter. You can also follow the district office at sba.gov forward slash PA. And um, if you need additional assistance, there's a place where you can um, go uh, at sba.gov local assistance. There's even a toll-free number there for those that have uh, um, for those that are looking for this advance and have some questions. But I will say up front, the that online application is very easy to follow, and I don't think anybody would have anybody certainly on this. Um, webinar would have any problem uh, uh, getting that advance if they've already applied for the idle loan. Now, as you saw in that announcement, that all, that all went into effect as of the passage of the CARES Act. The CARES Act has some other components to it. Uh, 
there, you know, you probably have seen some talk about it on the news. We have not received the official messaging on that yet, but there are, um, there are, there is additional relief available, and we will be getting that out as quickly as possible. The best way to stay tuned to that messaging is to sign up for updates, and we will blast it out as soon as it's available, and the the agency will uh, share it as well directly from that from that website. Um, that um, <clears throat> and I'll also. Uh, highlight the fact that there is a distinction here. Disaster loans are the only times that the applications that we've taken, the traditional disaster loan applications that we've taken up till now, those are the only time that the agency lends money to individuals and small businesses directly. And uh, they're unique in that regard. Those are loans direct from the U.S. Treasury to, to a business or uh, uh, an individual. Um, the CARES Act and all of its provisions and its additional assistance that it's going to provide uh, small businesses will be done through our lenders. And they will be, um, uh, I, th they're going to be uh, done much the same way or delivered much the same way as a traditional SBA loan. And I want to reiterate uh, one of the things that Dick mentioned in the previous segment in terms of providing them some patience. We are all getting up to speed on the provisions of this act simultaneously. Yeah, it's, there are some broad, um, broad parameters that we're, that we're all kind of aware of, but the actual mechanics of how this is going to work and the unique features of this particular uh, additional loan um, are really, really uh, game, maybe game changing for a lot of small businesses. And it, it is complete, you know, there are aspects of it that are completely different than uh, the traditional 7A loan. So banks need to get up to speed. Um, we are working uh, very, very hard in getting them up getting them up to speed, filling them in on as many details as possible. I personally am still waiting for official messaging, so I'm prohibited from talking about it at any great length. Um, uh, but it is gonna happen, and it's gonna, that information is gonna be available uh, very soon. Hopefully later on by Friday, you may find banks out there willing to talk to individuals about it, uh, I'm hoping to get some me official messaging certainly by tomorrow and um, and be able to talk to uh, talk about it in a little bit more detail. But for now, the big the big message that I want to leave with you is if you know anyone that's applied for an idle loan, make sure they go back to sba.gov forward slash disaster, apply for the advanced um, and also apply for updates going forward so that if there is additional relief that they want to pursue, it, it's, it will be there uh, from probably the lender they already do business with. Um, that's, about, that's about all I want to share this morning. I hope I haven't gone over my time too much or extended this too far. Dave. No, no, you're fine. Um, just a couple of real quick questions just for you. Somebody asked, how do I find my local loaner for SBA loans? Um, there is a online, uh, if you go to sba.gov forward slash PA, our, an online version of our resource guide is found there. It also contains a list of all the SBA lenders in our district by county. So, it's a pretty, pretty nice user-friendly list to go down. That resource guide is also something all of you guys are really familiar with and have several copies of. And if anybody wants to email me directly or whatever, I, um, I can uh, uh, make sure they get, the, uh, get a link to the online directory as well or the online resource guide as well. 
Okay, thanks. If we want to change the view, we can go over some of the questions. Uh, there's well over 60 questions. I, we won't get all, through all of them, obviously. Um, do you want to switch to the grid view, uh, Charlie? Make sure everybody's video is on. Well, Christina, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. Hi. Uh, one question is specifically for you. If, if an employee is on unemployment and there are some tasks they can do at home, can I let them do some paid task? Does this jeopardize their unemployment? Yes, it would okay. jeopardize their unemployment depending on the conditions upon which they are collecting unemployment. If they are on unemployment because they are laid off or furloughed, then it would jeopardize their unemployment because they would essentially be working and have to report that work income. Um, if their hours were reduced and they are collecting unemployment because of a reduced work schedule, then yes, you can give them those tasks on the reduced work schedule for which they continue to be employed with you. Thanks. The whole premise of unemployment is that they're no longer working for you. Okay, good. Uh, Jim, we had several questions that revolve around the same thing. Basically, can a sole proprietor apply for grants and loans under these programs? As, yeah, a sole proprietor can definitely apply for an idle loan. Um, you know, their their small business is, is, is more than qualified to apply, so... I would encourage them to apply. Hey, it costs nothing to apply. Uh, so please, 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 everyone out there that m might need some assistance, please go to the website. It's, it's actually been, the whole, the, the whole website's been um, re-engineered and redesigned. It is even more simple uh, today to apply than it was just a week ago. And they've had to do that uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, it's, it's even it's it's even easier than it's ever been, and states you know get plugged in for updates. The CARES Act is going to even provide another opportunity for small businesses to to get relief, and many small businesses, um, you know, may find themselves in a position where where they will need additional relief. So um, get familiar. Uh, uh, please wait until uh, my recommendation is wait until next week to contact the banker that knows you best, which is who we always suggest first that an individual go to, go to the bank, the guy that knows you best or the gal that knows you best and knows your business best and give them until next week uh, to get up to speed with all the provisions included in the CARES Act because we still are, we still are getting them up to speed from the district office and from from headquarters. So, um, thank you. As Dick said, please be patient with everybody. We're all kind of learning simultaneously here. The um, Lorraine asked that the the ten thousand dollar loan, which will help us pay when, needs to be paid back by when at, and at what percentage? The ten thousand dollar advance on the idle. If you've already uh, put in an idle application, um, it's the way I read that is that will be forgiven. Um, and oh, by the way, don't spend it on rent. Um, <clears throat> that's that gets back to what I was trying to tell everyone at the at the front end of my, you know, um, you know, the solution. The way the way a lot of small businesses are going to get through this is by talking with their landlord, talking with their banker about their conventional loans if they have them or any other loans that they have them and deferring as much as they can. Pretty much everything is deferrable. Everything's negotiable. And I'm, I'm not speaking in my official capacity as a member of the Eastern Pennsylvania District Office of the United States Small Business Administration. I'm talking as Jim Verbeck with lots of years of commercial banking behind him. You need to leverage all of your relationships and everyone that you do business with. And don't ever think for a minute, nothing is negotiable. 
everything's negotiable, especially in this day and age right now. We, nobody's ever been through anything like this. So don't, you know, the last thing I would recommend they do within, with the $10,000 is pay any rent right now. Uh, defer it if you can. De and I, I can't imagine uh, anyone out there not entertaining deferrals, especially on rents for a shopping center space or, or, or anything else. I'm saying that as personally, and I'm, I'm offering that personal advice. It's not a guy, you know, that's not official SBA advice. That's Jim Verbeck advice. Thank you. Um, I don't, this is it probably for Christina. With the small business exemptions, what happens to that essential employee if he or she gets sick? I'm not sure I understand the question. Christina? Did Christina leave? Nope, I'm here, sorry, I was on mute. Um, oh. Did you hear the not, question? Yes, I did. I'm not sure that I understand it either, except that if that person is the essential employee, they may qualify for the exemption, which means that they, you know, they may not have to apply the law to their staff who may request paid sick leave or extended FMLA. Okay. And, and then someone asked, and uh, I guess, I don't know who wants to answer this. Is the information presented here today pertinent to pertain to just Pennsylvania? Uh, I can answer for my piece that my, the Families First Coronavirus Act is federal legislation, so it doesn't matter what state you are in, that applies to you as well as the EEOC guidance. Those are all federal regulations. They're not um, state -based. And I can, um, everything I was mentioning with regard to the idle loan, it applies to the entire country. That's, uh, that's not unique to, well, um, I, let me back up for a second. Um, I nearly, <laughs> I don't know too many states, certainly no states around Pennsylvania haven't already declared, uh, haven't already been declared a disaster area. So for the idle loans, uh, for everyone in Pennsylvania, everything I said, and for all the, all the states, I think for the most part around Pennsylvania, the neighboring states, it certainly is apropos. I, I, I'm not aware of any states that haven't been declared a disaster area. There may, they may, there may be some in the Midwest, but I'm not, I'm not uh, exactly sure. I think that's the only, that's the only part of the country that may not have been impacted by this coronavirus so far. But for the, for all practical purposes, my comments are applicable uh, across the country. Thank you, uh, Christina. You said isolation does not count for stay in place order. We have, we have carpenters that go to people's homes, but we are not working due to the governor's order. Are we able to give the paid sick leave under FFCRA? Yeah, uh, um, not on that eligibility requirement. So, so, what we've seen is that most states have stay-at-home orders, and they've been very careful to call them stay-at-home orders and not isolation orders. <clears throat> so I do not believe that any state that has a stay-at-home order, and this is the consensus from the legal community around the country, is that <clears throat> a stay-at-home order does not qualify <clears throat> excuse me, under that first eligibility requirement to allow for paid sick leave. Okay. Um, if a part-time employee applies for unemployment for their full-time job at another firm, does that qualify, does that disqualify my tax credits if I continue to pay the part-time employee? <laughs> There's one for you. Okay. If I'm understanding that correctly, you have a part-time employee that's working for you that also has a full-time job where that person was laid off and is collecting unemployment on the basis of the full-time job. Yes. And then the question is, is what, Dave? 
is, does that qualify me or does that disqualify? Does that disqualify my tax credit if I continue to pay the part-time employee? Well, you wouldn't get the tax credit unless you paid for paid sick leave or extended family medical leave for that employee. But there's been nothing specific on that. If I had to give a legal educated opinion or guess on that, I would say no. I would say if you have paid in good faith for that employee to have paid sick leave on the basis of their continued working for you and they qualify in terms of one of those eligibility requirements, then I believe you would you should be eligible for that tax credit. I think we all have to remember that this is a evolving situation. I mean, this we've never been in this country's never been in this situation, at least in our lifetimes, uh, before. So the CARES Act is evolving and just getting sort of an some of these legal issues have yet to be determined they've never arisen before um and this is a quickie uh richard do you go to your bank for the economic disaster recovery loan or to the sba you go online for the economic income disaster loan good but you'll go to you'll go to your uh one of our sba lenders for um the cares act the uh, which we'll be uh, messaging um, later, hopefully later on this week. Okay, good. And again, the website for the emergency grant is sba.gov. Um, I think we have gotten, I would say, we certainly haven't addressed all of them, but I don't want, we would be here for another hour um, the ones that we didn't get to, uh, we will divvy up among our, our panel and um, they will provide answers, uh, certainly not today or tomorrow, but in the next couple of days, Dave, uh, we'll do our best to answer everything. Dave, I tried to answer while other people were speaking. I was kind of scrolling through the questions that apply yes. to me and I was trying to answer them as they were as they were being posted. So right. hopefully I answered some of them for you. Um, just one last question. Uh, I think this has been addressed, but independent contractors, I guess that 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 um, yeah, an independent contractor if if they have a part-time employment, are they eligible for something? They must qualify as an employee, either part-time or full-time. If they are working for you in a 1099 independent contractor capacity, they do not uh, meet the requirements. Okay. Nina, were you looking to say something? No, or? I was agreeing with Christina. That is correct. Okay. All right. Listen, there were almost 300 of you here. Uh, I certainly appreciate you taking the time. I hope you've got some useful advice. As I said, this, this situation evolves as we speak. More information is coming out every day. Uh, in terms of loans, I urge you to keep looking at sba.gov for the most latest information on the various loan programs and grants and other advice and, and contact our experts if you need more specific questions answered. Again, this has been recorded. You'll get a, you'll get a link very shortly. Uh, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the presenters. When we end the meeting, uh, it ends very quickly. So I won't have a chance other than now. To thank you for your time. Okay, Charlie.